Okay, everybody, it looks like we have lots of folks signed in, so we're going to get started. Welcome everyone for uh, joining us today for this webinar on the state of public transit 2020. I'm just going to walk us through our agenda briefly um, and a few technical things, and then we'll get to the real, the real meat of the story. So we're going to take a look at the agenda first. We'll start with a round of introductions, then we're going to have a couple of questions for our panelists, and we'll close things down with a live Q&A session for everyone who's joined us online. Um, many of you sent us amazing questions in advance of the webinar. I've already got those loaded up and we're going to weave them throughout the discussion. But if you think of new questions as we go, we want to make sure you know how to use the question functionality in this platform. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A button. So um, let's just test it out right now and make sure everyone can use it. Just pull it up and let us know where you're calling in from, what city or what agency. Um, and that will be the way that we check that you can use it. We've got some lots of responses rolling in here. We've got folks joining us from Oakland, from DART, Florida DOT, San Francisco. Um, and I'm actually joining you from beautiful Adelaide, South Australia, uh, where it's not quite light. So we can't see anything of the city, but it would be nice to show you otherwise. All right, so now that everybody is kind of set up technically and we know uh, you can contribute questions at any point throughout the webinar. And at the end, if we have time, we'll fold a few more into the discussion. Uh, we can dive in. So it's not every day that we get to have such an exciting panel of illustrious folks join us. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Why don't we start with you, Tamiko? Hi, I'm Tamiko Purcell. I'm a transportation planner at BTA in San Jose, California. Um, I lead capital projects, strategic studies, and BTA's Fast Transit program, which is our effort to make transit faster and more reliable through policy planning and project delivery. And I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. <laughs> Jerome? Hi, everyone. Jerome Horn joining from Indianapolis, and uh, I am Indigo's Ridership Experience Specialist. And that means I focus on the user experience of riding transit. So I'm focusing currently on wayfinding, um, redesigning of our maps and signs, looking at technology integration, mobile applications, open data, uh, and even fi figuring out how we have better vehicle design for our riders. So uh, anything that's customer centric and focused is uh, kind of in my wheelhouse and I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Jeff. I'm Jeff Wood, I'm the host of the Talking Headways podcast and uh, the owner of the Overhead Wire and uh, which is a, a media, media company that does media related transportation and urban planning. So we do a newsletter uh, podcast and, and more. Uh, and I'm Madeline Zhu. I'm the sales manager at Swiftly, which means that I work with transit agencies across North America, New Zealand, and Australia uh, to understand what their needs are, what their priorities are, and see if Swiftly can be uh, potentially useful for them. As I mentioned, I'm currently calling you from South Australia, but typically based in San Francisco. Um, and I'm delighted to have all of our panelists here today so that we can discuss the results of the 2020 State of Public Transit survey. So this is a report that Swiftly puts out every year. And this year we surveyed 100 transit professionals in the United States from all different parts of the country, different departments and roles. And then we put out a 32 page report that focuses on how the transit services in those areas operate today, areas of opportunity and opportunities to improve the rider experience. Um, and we wanted to start off actually with one of the questions that's closest to our hearts, um, which is why transit professionals went into the industry in the first place we found it was overwhelmingly to make the world a better place, uh, whether to make their communities more accessible, improve economic mobility, or battle climate change. And I would love to hear from our panelists, actually, as we get started, just why are you in transit? Who wants to go first? Yeah. Um, well, I think why I went into transit is a little bit different than why I'm in transit now, maybe a little, but I initially, after I graduated from high school, I traveled a lot before I went to college. And I think like a lot of people who travel to transit rich cities and countries, you become really smitten with how great transit is there compared to where you might live in North America. I grew up in a bedroom community in Canada where we had service about every hour and a half, um, but I still used it all the time. 
And then once I was traveling in other countries, I realized like transit's really great. You can access so many opportunities. And more than that, just the, the way transit enhances a place and its role in placemaking and actually being a place itself was really intriguing to me. So when I got back, I enrolled in university to get into urban planning and here I am. Uh, uh, I'll be honest, I, I got into transit, uh, or I was really interested in transit when I was much younger because I was really into trains and buses. Uh, but as I've gotten older, it, it's really become more about uh, giving people access to opportunity um, because transportation, uh, where you can get, get to, to is who we achieve and do. Uh, I know transit plays a big role in allowing people to achieve upward mobility, and that's one of the big reasons why I'm in the industry today. So I grew up in Houston, and my dad took the bus to work every day from our, the suburb where we lived, and I think that made a big impression of me, on me. My grandparents lived here in San Francisco as well, so we'd come and visit and, at you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving and take BART to, to downtown and, and other places around the region. And so you know, when I got to school, I started taking the bus to, to class and, and uh, started thinking, oh, well, what am I going to do with my life? I guess this, this geography thing sounds cool. Well, what's related to geography? Well, transportation oh, what, well, what's the cool part of transportation? Transit's the cool part of transportation. So here I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think um, all of those stories really resonate with the folks who responded to our survey and probably our participants as well. I think experiences with transit at an early age or getting to see the opportunities that it can unlock are really powerful. Um, so moving from why people join the industry to kind of the hot topics that people are thinking about today, obviously uh, on-time performance is kind of the key metric that most agencies are thinking about all the time. We saw a really high percentage of our respondents know what their on-time performance is system-wide and an even higher percentage of them see a correlation between ridership and on-time performance. Um, but I would love to hear from you guys, what do you think about the um, role that this metric plays at agencies and the perception of it that riders might have? Is it always consistent with what we think from inside the agency? Yeah, I'll start. I think that on-time performance uh, from the standpoint of being inside the agency seem, it seems to be uh, more useful for measuring service um, internally, but from a customer standpoint, uh, I, I think there's, there's a little bit of a different perception there, or the customer uh, is probably more concerned about, um, especially on high frequency service, uh, you know, how, how frequently that, that vehicle is coming versus on time performance. So uh, I think there's a little bit of a discrepancy there uh, when it comes to that metric and what it means and how, how we measure it. Mm. I think from a I think from a writer perspective, um, it's important to have on time performance because your mental map is a little bit different, I think, than what you perceive. Um, you know, the, when the bus is coming or the train is coming down the line and you can see it coming, you expect it to be there at a certain time. But if it's on your phone and it tells you that it's coming in two to three minutes, it might feel actually like five minutes. So I think there's a, a difference in perception. So the on time performance and whether the, the bus or train gets to the destination at a specific time that it, you're told that it's going to get there, I think is really important, especially for people's mental maps as they start to think about how they're going to get to work every single day. And if it's on, on time more often, it's actually going to lead to them being like, okay, well, I can take this trip uh, on this bus or this train rather than saying, well, maybe I will use another mode of transportation. Yeah, and we're going to actually return to that topic about the relationship between uh, the actual services on time performance and the reliability of the information that people have access to about that service in a, in a couple of minutes. So hold on to that thought. Tamiko, did you also want to comment on this one? I think that on time performance is really important for perception, just like they've mentioned. Um, and you also just want to know that you're going to get where you're going on time and be able to rely on that. Um, so I think consistently getting to your location on time is really important. Yeah. yeah. We definitely saw a trend about the importance of reliability and consistency throughout the different questions that people responded to, which I think is a, a good sign. Um, so as I promised, <laughs> the correlation uh, between prediction accuracy, the, the accuracy of the information that riders have access to and their perception of how reliable a service is was pretty overwhelmingly uh, agreed to by the respondents from the survey, like 93% of them seeing a correlation between ridership and the importance of accuracy of their real-time information. But 
I wonder, um, especially those uh, Tomiko and Jerome who work at agencies, um, is this something that you guys think a lot about? How do you approach this topic um, at Indigo and VTA? Yeah, so at, at Indigo, we uh, recently have uh, changed, uh, we've actually introduced uh, Swiftly into our system and uh, it's sitting on top of our existing CAD AVL system and gives us better, uh, better predictions. Um, you know, real-time information, as, as Jeff mentioned, it's really important if, you know, you have, if you're looking at a phone app and it says that bus is three minutes away, uh, but in reality, it might actually take five minutes because uh, the, because of getting through a particular intersection or a tricky part of town. And it's really important to have historic data on how long it might actually take that transit vehicle to navigate a particular segment of the route. And so uh, we're getting better real-time uh, predictions and better historical data, depending on time of day or segment of a route. And that helps increase the, reliab re uh, the reliability and, and the prediction accuracy of that information that we're giving to our riders. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, we're seeing that pay off. Yeah, I agree. We are getting much better at collecting data. I think Swiftly has been a big part of that for us to start to understand what's actually going on in the system, which is part of why we started the fast transit program to really get a sense for what our on-time performance is, how fast we're going, where our delays are. That was all really important, but we haven't really gotten to the point where we're correlating on-time performance with ridership yet or frequency with ridership. So that's things that we're starting to think about. We're just not quite sure how we're going to do it yet. Jeff, you were the one who kind of brought this up initially. Do you think um, that speaking with, you know, representatives from lots of agencies across the country and the world, how do you think the, the importance of kind of the accuracy of information that people can access compares to maybe the overall system measurements like OTP? Well, I think that it matters just from a, a, um, a writer perspective. As I mentioned, you know, writers are really uh, tuned into how they use the system and how they use technology these days. And so I think that, you know, partly it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, really can make or break your day on in terms of getting to where you want to go. I was talking to somebody the other day about um, taking trips. And I think that when you have access to something that's three to five minutes, away like a like a ride hail um at, at all times in some cities um i think that warps your perception of time to a certain extent and so the more that transit agencies can you know recreate that type of connection with people from you know giving them the information that they need coming in real time um the more that you know people are more likely to take transit i know that here in san francisco um, I'll look at my phone before I leave the house and I know exactly when the J is coming. I know exactly when the 48 is coming and I'll plan accordingly. And then I don't have to wait on, on the, the platform too much longer than I, I have to. Um, but then when the bus is late, we talk about ghost busts, <laughs> ghost buses. Um, and so that really affects my mood sometimes even. So I imagine that there's a lot of people who maybe aren't as, uh, kind or forgiving as I might be <laughs> in terms of taking the bus and dealing with ghost bus and other issues. So um, I think that's a big part of it as well. Mm, yeah. I guess one other thing that comes up a lot when we talk about um, perceptions and making sure you give good information to people is that the information that you give is only as good as the reliability of the service itself, right? So you can invest a lot in the technology to improve the accuracy of your information, but you will still want to definitely invest in the actual you know, corridors and infrastructure that allow you to have reliable service that's easy to predict in the first place. Um, and so I think that like leads very nicely to the next topic that we asked participants about, which is about capital improvements, right? Um, we asked survey respondents if you could wave a magic wand to improve one aspect of your transit service, what would it be? And the winner by 3% uh, was to implement capital improvements. Uh, but we didn't really drill into this, so I want to ask you guys, um, if you could wave a magic wand, which capital improvement would you implement? Maybe we'll start with Tamika this time. Um, I mean, I, I think before capital improvements, personally, I would want to work on frequency, but mm -hmm. since we're talking about waving a magic wand, I guess it would be bus lanes would be my, my preferred capital improvement, but what I would really like to see are more tactical bus lanes rather than really massive infrastructure projects. Um, so I think we have a need to get improvements on the ground now and they need to be quick and we need to learn from them. I would love to get the fast transit program to a place where 
we can do some quick builds and learn what works both for the cities we operate in and for VTA and see we're, build some support, build ridership, and then you know plan to move on to larger infrastructure projects based on that. I think that would kind of be my dream capital project. Mm. Yeah. I like to dream big and uh, I like to dream a little bit ridiculous too. So um, I think I've told you all before, I, I really like a subway system in, in San Francisco, uh, a complete network that goes everywhere. I really, really want to go and get dumplings in the Richmond more often. And it takes a lot of time to get there on the bus and yeah. uh, it, it limits my access to dumplings. So uh, a bigger, <laughs> a bigger, a bigger subway system would be awesome. It is a magic wand after all. So dream big. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to agree with uh, Tomiko that bus lanes uh, for me would be the number one priority. Uh, it's just uh, we, you know, giving the bus the priority that it needs and, and allocating the street space uh, for transit to be successful and the street design for transit to be successful uh, is, is really important. And so, yeah, bus lanes would be the number one thing for me. And if you follow Jerome on Twitter, you'll see that he has really good video of what bus lanes can yes. actually do. <laughs> yes, great video. And if you look behind Jeff's head, you'll see that he has, in fact, a bus lane as a scarf. Um, so every, everyone here is a big fan of those. Um, but I kind of want to dig in a little bit to what you said to Miko about um, tactical bus lanes and having different policies that allow you to do kind of experimental or quick build innovations. Um, it sounds like, you know, everybody agrees that something like bus lanes would be a significant improvement. Um, but what other kinds of innovations or changes to policy, perhaps, or legislation would you want to see to support your ability to do projects like that? Um, well, obviously, we need funding. So any funding that supports quick build projects and supports more tactical initiatives, um, and supports what goes along with capital projects like design and um, the planning portion of it. And then with the policy, you know, at VTA, we operate across 15 different cities and each one of those has, you know, different priorities. So having transit first policies in place is a, a really important part of moving transit faster and of getting bus lanes and having that priority set aside on the street because we don't have land use authority. Um, so we are working hard with our local jurisdictions to see what sort of policy changes can be made that can really support the changes and empower staff to make decisions that will help move transit faster. Yeah, I think one of the things we talked about um, earlier when we were preparing for this is about um, when we talk about innovation, we focus a lot on either technology or like physical innovations in infrastructure, but changes to policy can be even more impactful and just as innovative. Um, and so I think that's also something that we didn't ask so much about in the survey itself, uh, but which we certainly will ask about next year. Um, and if anybody else has a, a favorite uh, policy that you'd like to propose or one that would be included in your magic wand, feel free to, to comment. <laughs> I think Jeff has one. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> I don't know. You know <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. I mean, you know, San Francisco has a transit first policy. And, and while we might make fun of sometimes because we feel like the Board of Supervisors isn't implementing it, um, you know, it's, it's really important to have that as policy. And I think one of the other things that I, I talk a lot, of, a lot about and something that I heard actually a long time ago from Jeff Tumlin is that you're your budgets reflect your realities, not your, your, you know, and your policies. Um, because what you put your money towards is actually what you're doing. So we see at the federal level, for example, you see a lot of money going to highways and like, you know, the 80, 20 split in the capital funding program, for example. And, uh, you know, it tells you what your, your priorities are. So I think that in a lot of cities, if, if your priorities are, you know, money away from, from transit or transit improvements, um, you know, it doesn't seem that you, you're um, focused so much on the improvements uh, in that form or fashion. So I think that um, that's kind of one of the big things for me is that you can you can have policies and I and I appreciate policies. And I like I said, the, the transit first policy is a really good one because it, it leads you in the right direction. But I think also the budget's really a, a big issue as well. And, and that's um, what determines whether your policy becomes a reality. Yeah, sure. So uh, we didn't ask only really serious questions in our survey. Um, we also, this is our second favorite question, is we asked folks what they would do if they could improve their ridership by a whopping 10%. 
Um, and unsurpri unsurprisingly, most would give up their car for a year. I imagine this is a bit cheeky because probably some of these folks didn't have cars in the first place. <laughs> so it would be easy for them to give them up. But surprisingly, more people would live with their in-laws for two weeks. Um, but only 27% of people would eat a worm. And I personally think like it's only one worm it's over and done with, you know, 10% is a big bump in ridership. <laughs> but what, what would you guys do for a 10% increase in ridership? Any of these stand out to you? I think I might, I think I might, you know, cut off a finger. That, that'd be, a, that'd be a good trade off, right? For 10% ridership increase. Is this a permanent increase or like a, a, a increase only for a year? <laughs> uh, let's go with the permanent increase to make it worth a finger. Okay. Okay. Take <laughs> off a finger. Um, well, I've had a root canal, so I would have no problem doing that. It's not bad. <laughs> um. <laughs> you must have had one of the good ones. <laughs> um, but we actually asked this at a meeting yesterday, um, just casually as a sign-in sheet, what people would do. And there, there was a couple interesting ones. Someone would run a marathon. Um, there was people willing to give up alcohol. Mm. Um, <laughs> my boss said that he'd shave his head. Um, although, you know, it's not a big stretch shaving his head. Um, there's a few in there. Eat a Klondike bar. <laughs> <laughs> is, that a, is that a negative or a positive? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so for me, um, I can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, I'd probably be willing to break my other arm for a 10% increase in ridership. So I fell off a scooter last year and broke my left arm. So uh, yeah, for a 10% increase in ridership, I'd probably be willing to break my arm again. Oh my gosh. See, this is transit professionals go into transit because they really care. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> also, scooters are dangerous. Exercise caption in micro. Yes, that's a different webinar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of different webinars, uh, one thing that we would be remiss if we didn't at least nod to the elephant in the room as a major factor affecting ridership right now um, is, of course, the COVID 19 virus, which, uh, you know, yesterday Jared Walker put out a new article looking at the possible different strategies that he would suggest for agencies to cope with a sudden plunge in ridership that we're starting to see at a few cities already. Um, and so this is not something that we covered in this survey or report because of course it came out a while ago. Um, but to all of the participants who are joining us on the web, if you would like to or be interested in a future webinar where different agencies come together to share some best practices or things that they might have experienced on this topic, uh, just write in the Q&A if that's something that you would be keen to join um, and we will look into organizing such a thing in the future, um, but not something that we're gonna talk about today. So you can do that at any point in the next half hour or so. All right, um, Tamika, one of the things that you talked about was frequency. And um, that is something that we also talked a lot about in the state of public transit. Um, but interestingly, there's some, some dissonance maybe amongst the different responses. So there is some research that shows that for every 1% improvement in frequency, there's about a 0.4% increase in ridership. So not as good as a worm or breaking your arm, but uh, a little bit more uh, agency acceptable perhaps. Um, and so we, Despite that, we see that about 54% of our respondents don't track the headways of their high-frequency routes, and some of them don't know if they're tracking. So we put out a little live poll for everybody online. Um, do you currently measure reliability for high-frequency routes? Uh, just click yes, no, or I'm not sure. And uh, in a second, we will have everyone's responses. So we can see um, what, what people are saying and whether your experiences line up with the numbers that we have here. Give everyone a second to vote. And I see uh, while people are voting here for a second, um, I'd love to ask our panelists, um, do you guys currently measure headways on your high frequency routes? Is that something that you're aiming to do? Do you see the correlation? Um, how do you treat this topic? Uh, yeah. We don't currently measure frequency, um, particularly in its relationship to ridership right now, but as I said earlier, it's something we really want to get into. We just haven't quite figured out what is the right way to do it, um, especially since we use time points for our, mm. for our scheduling. 
Yeah, in Indianapolis, we're, we're just getting into measuring frequency or headway uh, on our new Redline BRT route. Um, we currently are not measuring headway on our on our 15-minute local routes uh, just yet. Um, it's you know still a, kind of an emerging thing for us, but um, definitely um, you know we we've been making improvements uh, on several of our routes, and we're gearing up for our actual system redesign this June. Uh, but the routes we have already increased frequency on, you know, we're definitely seeing, uh, we've, we've seen a, an increase in ridership. And in fact, for the month of January, our system ridership was up by 8% overall. Uh, so um, d definitely there, there, there is a correlation between increased frequency and increase in ridership. Uh, but currently, yeah, we're only measuring headway on our, our Redline BRT. And it's a challenge. Yeah. Absolutely. Jeff, you talk to agencies all over the place. Um, do you find that many of them are having similar challenges to what uh, Indigo and VTA are doing? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there's a... Sorry, my brain just froze for a second. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a, there's an issue, there's a, a, a a, um, a struggle with frequency at, at a lot of agencies and um, partly because it's, it's, it's a lot of funding issues. And um, I think that one of the things that pops up a lot is, is a, a request for, for frequency, but um, a lot of agencies can't because of the, the funding um, reductions. And I know that this is happening, for example, at BART, where there's problems with um, frequency in the evenings and, and, and nighttime because of, uh, because of track fixes and things like that. So um, it's something that affects writers, uh, definitely. We actually just had a, a comment come in through the chat that says, I'm surprised that improving frequency and service span did not appear in the magic wand question. In my experience of doing benchmarking among peer transit agencies, I found that the top correlation was per capita service hours to per capita ridership. So maybe also something that's on a lot of other people's minds. Is anybody else thinking that might be there? Well, it was kind of in your magic wand to me, go, but... <laughs> yeah, freq I would have chosen frequency over a capital improvement for sure. Yeah. yeah, I guess inherent. I guess inherent in my in my capital improvement was uh, frequency overall. I think it, if you could get a subway to to try, you know come every two minutes or so, I think that's a big frequency upgrade. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I mean, you're right. I mean, like if you think if you're separating everything out individually, it does it does make the probably the biggest difference to to ratchet up the frequencies on 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 the routes. Yeah. Well, I know, Jerome, you mentioned Indigo's new Redline BRT. Um, how did that process unfold for you guys to be able to build political support for that line and get that implemented and live? Like, it's a big change for an agency. Yeah, so the Redline is really uh, the first part of a, a comprehensive system redesign, and the Redline serves as the central spine of that. And uh, you know, for us, uh, the, the phase one of the red line that exists today uh, is about 60% uh, dedicated lanes with center running uh, lanes for about seven miles. And um, there's definitely, you know, a challenge to build up support for taking away lanes for cars to, to put in those center running lanes. And, uh, you know, we worked a lot with uh, the public and with city officials, elected officials, trying to talk about the, the, the need for reliability and a sense of permanence and kind of driving those points home that if, if we want this to work well, uh, we need the service to be reliable and we need it to have that dedicated running way so that it, that it can perform at an optimal level. And so there's a lot of discussion that went back and forth, uh, you know, for, for a few years about uh, what that meant and, and kind of the design of the street and how that would allow us to to not only uh, run service more, more frequently and more reliably, but also make the streets safer. There were some goals of achieving, of achieving traffic calming and minimizing um, pedestrian conflicts and, and auto uh, crashes that were happening on certain streets. And by designing the center running bus lanes, we were able to mitigate uh, some of those crashes that were caused by um, you know, turning conflicts and other movements. And so uh, kind of using a bunch of data and, and coming in with, uh, those, with, uh, with those viewpoints and talking about the design of, of the street, we were able to, to make the argument for that. 
Um, and so far, uh, it's been working really well on that particular section of the line where we have the, the dedicated lanes that is um, more or less the, the more reliable part of, of the breadline BRT. Yeah, that actually segues really nicely to another question that we just got, which is about building political support for bus lanes or other high frequency um, infrastructure or even services. And I know that, of course, Tomiko, you've got a lot of experience with building political support across the 15 <laughs> jurisdictions that you guys run across. Um, I don't know if anybody, Jerome, you mentioned like linking it to other city goals around safety and also the perception and building a sense of you know reliability and helping people understand how that changes riders' perceptions. And Jeff was talking about earlier, the sense of like trusting it and knowing you can just walk up there and it will be there. Um, but what else, what else do you think you guys um, try to employ or strategies that you uh, would recommend around building that kind of political and public support? Well, I think in addition to proving that it works, I think that you also have to, um, you know, let people know that uh, the increase is going to be valuable to the community as a whole. I mean, you have um, the importance of transit overall, which is to connect people with jobs to places where they want to go. And I think if people can't see that, it's really hard for them to think about voting for more money for, for more transit improvements. And so if you can make the case and build coalitions, I, I think it actually works out in the end. Um, it, it's, it's hard work, obviously, but you, you just can't have an election to say, oh, we're going to have an election and see whether people like this or not. You actually have to tell them why you want to have, uh, you know, increased funding to build more, more frequency into the lines. I mean, if, for example, you know, Charlotte had an election back in 2007. And one of the things that was most talked about in the newspapers was the light rail line. But what they actually did was they increased bus service 100%, I believe. And they also increased ridership 100% through that bus before the, the light rail line even opened. And I think that type of those types of improvements where you get the, the tangible results and you can actually tell people about the results. That's the other thing is collecting the data to tell people, you know, what they're paying for is actually working out is really important, too. Um, but I think if you see those tangible results and, and, and uh, you know, I know the newspapers and a lot of folks uh, in the media focus on the big projects and, and uh, I, I mentioned subways earlier, but it is really the improvements that come and the data that's collected that show you that it actually works to allow you to build that political capital to do more expansions in the future. And I just want to add on, you know, for us in Indianapolis, uh, we, we passed a referendum in, in 2016 by nearly 60% uh, to support a tax for transit. And, you know, one of the biggest things for us is we, we kept talking about, uh, Jeff, as you mentioned, a total system improvement. Uh, yeah, the red line grabs all the headlines, but uh, really the, the, the increase, and it's about a 70% increase in revenue service hours um, for us when it's all said and done with the system redesign. Uh, so that, that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a huge margin and a huge increase uh, of frequent service that, that we're able to provide for residents of the city of Indianapolis. And really driving that home that the access that that was going to provide for people uh, uh, is was really a key part of the messaging as well that it's not just one project or one corridor but, but a comprehensive system so our poll results are in and it's fascinating it's actually almost the same numbers as the ones that we found in our report but flipped over so actually, um, of the people joining us today, 55% of them do currently measure reliability for their high frequency routes, 13% of them do not, and 32% of them are not sure. So we've just rearranged the numbers, basically. Um, that's really interesting. But I know also, we've talked a little bit about the difficulty of doing these measurements, um, technically speaking, both you know, for Tomiko and for Jerome, this hasn't been an easy project and it's still ongoing. Um, and we have some questions about sort of uh, technologies that you would consider game changing. So they don't have to be technologies on the topic of measuring headways, but if you have one of those, I think that would be very pertinent. Um, but maybe if everybody has uh, a technology or technical innovation that you also think can be powerful in this area, uh, our participants would like to hear about it. Um, I guess I'm thinking about sort of a game changing technology that I'm seeing right now is the machine learning cloud-based transit signal priority. We just finished a, a pilot that was just a few months long, testing it out, just seeing how it would kind of integrate with existing controllers and with our transit vehicles. And while we still have a lot more study to do, we did find that uh, it improved transit speeds by about 20% where it was installed. And the software learned over time 
time. So it was able to adjust to changing conditions throughout the day without needing a staff member to make any adjustments. It reduced the amount of staff time used for O&M, which I think is really huge when it comes to transit signal priority. Um, the cost, I'm not sure how that's going to work out in the future because it doesn't require any equipment or any changes for the city or for the transit agency, which is really great, um, but it is subscription based and there's not a lot of funding mechanisms out there for this type of service. So we'll have to see how you know, that can be funded in the future, but we're hoping to do a longer pilot and learn a lot more from it and see how it works. And I think that for a transit agency like ours, that's operating across so many different um, cities and you know, we think our transit routes are on about 2000, we go through about 2000 intersections. Um, that could be a, a real game changer for cost savings and for O&M for us. Nice, that sounds very exciting. So one of the other questions that we asked folks about is about knowledge sharing, which is of course what we're doing right now. Um, and one of the things that we found right away is that agencies have a lot of great things to say about their peers. So many amazing kind of stories and compliments were shared through the State of Public Transit report. Um, and most agencies consider agencies of a similar size to be their peers, but also similar regions. Uh, who do you guys look to in terms of um, knowledge sharing or maybe inspirations? Um, Jeff, in your case, who do you think is a, a great kind of standout agency that others could learn from? Well, I'm gonna go to the East Coast. I think that, um, you know, what Miami-Dade is doing with, um, you know, payment collections is really interesting right now uh, with their uh, contactless pay payment systems. Um, what New York City is doing with Omni is really interesting. Obviously, there's um, you know good examples of this all over the world with the uh, Oyster Card and the Octopus Card and things like along those lines that I'm really looking forward to using at some point in the future. Um, but uh, I think that that's something that we don't talk about as much as like the fair payment collection and, and those types of things. So I think um, those are really interesting to me, and those agencies have been really stepping up and, and doing some new and innovative stuff. Not to say that others haven't, but those are the ones that are on my mind. Nice. At, at Indigo, yeah, we uh, spend a lot of time, uh, we look up to TriMet in, in Portland, uh, particularly a lot of their customer facing information we think is really, really good. Um, we also spend a lot of time talking to uh, Coda in Columbus, Ohio, similar size system, similar type system to us, uh, and uh, spend time really uh, talking with their staff, uh, facing um, similar challenges to us and, and seeing how we can both help each other out. Nice. I like that we have examples from all over the country. Um, so one of the uh, things that we did also want to do is get to a few other questions from folks. Um, we have uh, maybe one other one that we have some time to speak to. Um, let me just pull it up here. Oh. So this one is about um, getting, structuring compelling arguments, particularly with data, uh, for people who might not be directly served by transit to get them to support transit. So maybe they're suburban dwellers or people who are far away. Um, so you've talked a little bit about this with referencing like safety and land use and things like that, but what do you guys think are good strategies to build the support that you need for um, these transit improvements that we all would like to see? I think that um, focusing on bigger picture issues like, um, well, safety, but also sustainability is resonates with a lot of people who aren't transit riders and they're interested in better commutes. So if you can tie your data and your transit improvements to also improving um, you know, vehicle travel times as well, that can really benefit transit. You can get a win-win there. And I think the biggest thing though is trying to find what resonates with each group of people. So dividing out your, your groups into different types of stakeholders you can still have the same general message, but how you deliver that message varies a little and you just need to bring everybody on your journey with you. So if they come along the journey, they start to realize why the improvements are happening, why you need to do this and what the benefits are to them and to the greater good of your city. Um, so I think resonance is just a really important part and that takes time. You have to distill your data to figure out what is gonna make the biggest impact with each of your stakeholder groups. But in the end, I think um, we've seen some success with that. Yeah, I agree with what Tamiko said. Uh, in Indianapolis, when we're going through the referendum process and, and educating, um, you know, we we had kind of this this comprehensive uh, bucket of different messaging depending on the audience. Um, but you know, one of the things we said, uh, and this isn't so much from a data standpoint, but we just said, you know, you may not ride transit, but someone you depend on does. 
Um, and, you know, that, that was kind of a general thing that seemed to resonate with, with a lot of different people, you know, whether it's the service worker in the hotel hospitality industry or things like that, that, that was a big point that we drove home quite a bit and that seemed to, to work well with a vast majority of people. But yeah, the, I think it's really important that you have, um, uh, different types of messaging for, you know, the, the wide variety of audiences that you'll, that people talk to. And to, to Jerome's point a little bit, I think that we can talk a little bit more about access and what that means to people generally in life. I, I, I um, mentioned the other day to somebody else, I can't remember, um, but it was, I think at the turn of the century, our, our transportation costs were around 2%. And now the average American, I think, spends 17 and 19% on transportation every year. And in some places, the suburban areas, it's up to, you know, 23, 25, even maybe even 30% when you get up to the super commuters and those folks. Um, when they're you know commuting to work, and so I think that you know providing access to a lot of different folks um, using transit is really important and important discussion to have. I mean, the University of Minnesota started doing their elements of access uh, data you know poll where they show basically how long it takes certain people to get to work on transit or on bikes and other places. So we're starting to see this research come out, and I think it's a really big point in terms of connecting people with places where they want to go. Absolutely. Um, if you have a question, those on the line and you haven't submitted it yet, this is the moment to do it. We have time for maybe one or two more. Um, so one question uh, maybe for Jeff and for Jerome is uh, about the driver shortage. So somebody has written in to ask, how will we solve the driver shortage? Um, and maybe you don't have to solve it on the line, but I know a lot of agencies are facing a challenge of having enough operators to get make service every day. Is that something that you're seeing elsewhere? Any ideas about how you might be addressing that? I mean, we see that here in, in San Francisco, and I've seen it, you know, a number of news articles all over the country talking about this issue. Denver specifically has thought about c cutting their service. Um, I think they, and then, I think it was yesterday or the day before the Denver Post said that they were thinking or trying really hard not to, not to do that. Um, one of the interesting things that's happening here in San Francisco is that we're starting to think about re- developing our bus yards. And so we have huge yards inside the city that are in really good urban areas and they have um, a lot of land associated with them. And when they transfer over to electric uh, buses and a lot of them are, I mean, the, one of the bus yards that we're talking about here is electric trolley bus yard. So it doesn't have the same infrastructure that goes along with uh, fuel depots and all those other things. They're starting to think about building housing on top. And so one of the things that I think is really tough for some drivers here in the Bay Area, specifically where the housing costs are so high, is getting to work. And some of them drive two hours a day to get to work, and then they drive all day, and then they have to drive two hours home. And that seems untenable to me. Um, one of the potential fixes for that is in this one of these bus yards, so Prochero Yard for specifically, um, they're thinking about build, building housing on top of the bus yard. So, um, you know, housing people who need a uh, you know, place to live while they're actually working for the agency as well um, and living closer and, and being closer. And I know this is, might be a little bit more of a big city issue. Um, I know there's an affordable housing issue all over the country, but um, you know, one of the things that, um, that I think might help is actually providing some of these, uh, you know, some of these extra perks for drivers because there, there definitely is a, an issue with housing and, and other um, expenditures that come into play when you're trying to hire uh, drivers. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty innovative way to try to solve that, actually. Okay, last question, um, in particular for our planner folks, um, which is how closely are transit professionals working with city planners and those who make zoning policies? Uh, that did come up a couple times as something that you'd like to do more of. Um, maybe share some thoughts on how you're doing it already. Uh, in uh, Indianapolis, uh, with our, our, our transit system redesign, and particularly our, our, our three BRT lines, um, we're beginning to work really closely with the city on some TOD policy and, and, and zoning. Um, uh, we, you know, really see that um, the land area around our BRT lines is going to be really important to, to capture that and utilize that to its full potential. And so we as a transit agency uh, are, are working closely with our, what we call our Department of Metropolitan Development that oversees kind of land use and zoning and really taking a comprehensive look at how we can upzone in certain places and, and make sure that we are getting uh, the highest and best use uh, along those future corridors and thinking about intentionally about uh, trying to encourage the right type of development there. So a uh, lot is still in early discussions, but we're trying to make sure that we're, we're at the table 
and that we're articulating to the city, um, you know, how this can help meet goals of, of increasing density and sustainability as well. Nice. So um, I think we all know transportation and land use go hand in hand and uh, land use planning or working with land use planners at cities is a really big part of what we do every day. We coordinate with our local jurisdictions on a very regular basis. We hold monthly or uh, quarterly meetings, depending on which jurisdiction it is. Uh, we talk very frequently. We support each other's grant applications. We're always working together and trying to figure out how we can make transit more seamless and um, just do better overall for the county. We also have a whole team, a land use team here that works on these types of issues and coordinates these, if these um, efforts and builds the relationships. We've adopted a land use policy at BTA. Uh, we also have a real estate department that is working on TOD efforts and um, other real estate issues. So it's something we're very involved in and we all try and work together really well um, and grow those relationships. They're really important between BTA and our local jurisdictions. So I was, a, I was part of a, writing a TRB paper with, um, with some folks, Robert Severo and, um, and some other folks back in 2014, 2015 timeframe. And we looked at how transit agencies can affect land use uh, policy. And one of the things that we found is it takes really strong leaders to actually lead uh, agencies into these decisions um, because there, there's a lot that you know, staff can do. However, um, if it's not something that's a policy from the top, it, it makes it harder to do. And so these coordination efforts um, that happen between the land use agencies and the transit agencies are something that's, that can be kind of pushed forward by a, a, good, a good leader. And so I know that's kind of hard to attain a good leader sometimes, but it's one of the things that is uh, partly the key to actually connecting the dots with uh, land use and transportation. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to everyone who joined us online. Um, you can read the State of Public Transit report if you would like to download it. You can find it at our website, goswift.ly. Um, and otherwise, thank you all so much for your thoughts, your contributions. There's obviously a lot of work to be done, so we can all get back to it. Thanks so much. Thank you.